So we're in the archives of Aboriginal knowledge now. Information respecting the history, condition, and prospects of the Indian tribes of the United States, collected and prepared under the Bureau of Indian Affairs by Henry R. Schoolcraft. Basically, this is called the Schoolcraft Archives. This is volume three of this collection. He was a member of the Royal Geographic Society, London Royal Antiquarian Society, Copenhagen Ethnology Society, Paris. All right, we're going to see what he had to say, what these people had to say about certain tribes over here in California. We go to page 102 and it's talking about uh, the people in Bodegas Bay. It says here another tribe of the Tumale Nias. Use a different one. In appearance, these Indians differ entirely from Chinooks and other coast tribes of Oregon, being taller and darker. They have quite heavy mustaches and beards on the chin, beards, but not much on the cheeks, and they almost all suffer it to grow. Several were noticed with gray heads and beards. They are ugly and brutish race, many with Negro, Negro profiles, Negro profiles, and some of the old men resembling Chinese figures of their deities. Listen to this, Negro profiles that resemble Chinese deities. We're in this book now. It's called Sights in the Gold Region and Scenes by the Way by Theodore T. Johnson. This is from 1849, 1849. So someone's talking about how he's in an encampment these encampments or so-called missions or so-called slave mines, really, they had the Indians digging the gold, you're gonna read. Uh, it says here, it's in between two rolling hills called the Green Springs, as the little mud hole so denominated was in the midst of a patch of greener or more abundant grass than usual. I right, Green Springs, looks like it might be around Sacramento, Green Springs Ranch today. So he says, while here, some 20 warriors came in from a neighboring rancheria following each other in regular Indian file across the hillside. These were a part of one of the numerous small tribes of California Indians called Diggers. This name they have received as characteristic of their habits, either of digging large holes in the ground for sanitary purposes called sweat houses, or from their custom of digging and eating various kinds of roots. They also eat a species of grass and wild clover when prompted by hunger. Their principal food, however, consists of acorns and preparations from them. These are very abundant and we found them quite sweet and palatable. This race of Indians is probably inferior to all others on the continent. Many of them are diminutive in stature, but they do not lack muscular strength. And we saw some who were tall and well-formed, all right? These were all partially clad in every kind of toggery obtained at the trading post and armed with short bows 
lined very skillfully with raw hide, hard as bone and capable of propelling their arrows with great force and precision. The Indians of the mountains are not so well clothed, and we saw many entirely naked. Now listen to this. Pay attention, right? What I'm about to drop on you. Their complexion is a dark mahogany, all right? Their complexion is a dark mahogany or often nearly black. Their face is round or square with features approximating nearer to the African, nearer to the African than the Indian, all right? You listening? How clear can that be? He's saying these are so-called Negroes. That's what he calls an African with features approximating nearer to the African than the Indian dark mahogany, dark mahogany complexion with features approximating nearer to the African than the Indian, all right? But they're not Africans. They're not Africans. They're Indians, all right? That's how he can describe it best. He's saying, look, they look like this so you can get a clear perspective. All right, so we're in this book. From the Department of the uh, Interior, U.S. Geographical and Geological Survey of the Rocky Mountain Region, just contributions to North American Ethnology, Volume 3, Tribes of California by Stephen Powers from 1877. So about Chapter 1 here, we're talking about the Karok, or the Tribes of California, Northern California in this case, on the Klamath region. It says here the Karok are probably the finest tribe in California. Their stature is only a trifle under the American. They have well-sized bodies, erect and strongly knit together, of an almost feminine roundness and smoothness, the legs better developed than the arms. And when a Karok has the weapon to which he is accustomed, a sharp stone gripped in the hand, he will face a white man and give him a handsome fight. The Klamath face is a little less broad than that of the Sacramento in early manhood, nearly as oval as the American. Cheekbones large and round caped, but not too prominent. Head brashy, cephalic, eyes bright, moderately well-sized and freely open straight across the face. Nose thick, walled and broad, all right? The nose is thick, straight as the Gresham. Nares avoid, root not so depressed, as in the Sacramento Valley, forehead low and wide, nearly on a perpendicular line with the chin, color ranging from hazel or buff hazel to old bronze and almost black. Okay, again, from what? From hazel, this is their complexion, from hazel, buff hazel to old bronze and almost to black, almost to black, okay? So we all know what kind of like hazel you know, kind of looks like if you guys, you know, the hazel color, right? Kind of brownish. This is a version of it. There's different, there's a palette so you can see, you know, hazel uh, color palette. You guys can see. And then we got old bronze, right? Uh -oh, old bronze, right? As it says here, vintage old bronze, old bronze, right? Another version here it says colored loose silver leaf, old bronze, old bronze. All right, you guys see old bronze. Another version of old bronze, kind of like copper colored tribes of America. And then we got a darker versions of bronze. Look at this, right? Old bronze, Chinese chalice, dragons engraved. Oh, look at that. Dracons, the, the dracons engraved on it, all right? On the old bronze. So again, these, these people here, the Kato, these are their colors, colors ranging from hazel or buff hazel to old bronze and almost to black, almost to black. In chapter four, it says here, the Jura, this large tribe inhabit the Klamath from the junction of the Trinity to the mouth and the coast from Gold Bluff up to a point about six miles above the mouth of the Klamath. Their name is of Karok origin. They themselves have only names for separate villages as Ri, Kwa, Mita, Pek Wan, Srigon, White Speck, Living nearer the coast, there are several shades darker. So listen, remember the other tribes we just read about? They were from hazel to almost black, right? Now they're saying that these people are even darker shades than the Karok, frequently almost black, literally almost black, so-called black, so-called Negro. And they are not so fine a race, having lower foreheads and more 
projecting chins. On the coast, they incline to be pudgy in stature, though on the Klamath, there are many specimens of splendid savagery. <laughs> all right, so dodge the hijack, how they be wording these things about savages and all that. We're in uh, chapter 10 here, and it says the Pat Awat. Around Humboldt Bay, there is a broad margin of land, which is without dispute the most valuable compact body of soil for agricultural purposes in all the northern parts of the state. The very jewel of the Californian coast. Over in the second paragraph says here, the Patawat live on the lower waters of Mad River and around Humboldt Bay, as far south as Arcata, perhaps originally as far down as Eureka. They are black-skinned. Again, they are black-skinned, so-called black, dark complexion, so-called Negroes, pudgy in stature, well-cushioned with adipose tissue, with little berry-like eyes, often bleared, low foreheads, harsh black, stiff hair, extremely timid and inoffensive and a prey all their lives long to the most frightful and ghoulish superstitions I have heard anywhere. All right, that was his uh, uh, opinion about them. But he's letting you know, again, they are what? So-called black-skinned. Continuing further ahead in the book, it says here, the Yuki have disproportionately large heads mounted like cannonballs on smallish short bodies with rather protuberant abdomens. Their eyes are trifle undersized but keen and restless and from the execrable greenwood smudge in which they live in winter they are not unfrequently swollen and horribly protruding. Their noses are stout, short and straight, the nares expanded and they have heavy shocks of stiff bristly hair. Listen to this, cut short and hence bushy bush bushy looking stiff bristly hair bushy looking they are variously complexion all right many shades copper colored tribes of america without any perceptible law from yellowish all right yellowish not yellow yellowish all right not white light skin right but to brown all right to brown brown skin and almost black so-called black almost black brown blush we know they're not talking about white when they're saying black okay because they went from light to dark so almost black with bushy looking hair huh do you see do you understand now again let's pretend this is a police officer giving a description yes we got a suspect here he's uh brown to almost black uh bushy looking hair and again so you know what i'm talking about we're right here in uh, chapter 19. It says here that Ga Yi Nomero or the Gali Nomero in Russian River Valley from Cloverdale down to the Redwood Belt and south to the Santa Rosa Creek and also in Dry Creek Valley live the remnants of a tribe whom the Spaniards call the Gali Nomero Nation. The Gali Nomero proper occupy only Dry Creek and Russian River below. Hellsburg within the limits above named, while above Hellsburg, principally between Gatesville and Cloversdale, are the Misal, La Magun, or Musal Lacun, and the Caime. This nation may be considered a branch of the great family of the Pomo, whose habitat is coextensive with Russian River Valley, covers the lowlands on the northwest of Clear Lake, all includes all the habitable coast from the Usal Creek down to Bodega. Now I want to show you guys what it says about this tribe. It says they are nearly black. They are what? Nearly black. So-called black. Dark skin. So-called Negroes. Ventura being the blackest of all. Ventura is their chief. One of their chiefs. He is the blackest of all. The chief. The chief is the so-called blackest of all. And on a warm sunny day in February, when he is chopping wood briskly, his cuticle shines like that of a louisiana field hand what wait a minute is that a racist remark are you trying to say he's he looks like a so-called slave or somebody working on a on a plantation or something i hope that's not what he's trying to say but listen to the analogies and he's describing him it says here the nose is moderately high straight and emphatic with thick walls and avoid of nearly round nares lips rather thick and sensual forehead low but nearly perpendicular with the chin face rounder and flatter than in the atlantic indian eyes well sized and freely open straight across the face freely open all right 
with sluggish but foxy expression, color varying from old bronze or brown almost to black. Again, we're talking about these Indians here. All right. Though an occasional freckled face, a freckled face and sparse whisker betray a touch of Castilian blood in the veins. They live. Continuing a little further, uh, in the book it says here the Patwin, all right, the Patwin tribe present as good an illustration as any of the traditional digger Indian physique. And it will be well to describe it somewhat minutely. A little further down says the color of their complexion, right? Varies from a brassy, brassy, and a hazel, almost to a jet black, jet black. All right, you see copper colored tribes of America, not just one shade, many shades, but you see the trend, right? and even jet black even jet black okay jet black so-called negro right i'm in chapter 28 and it says here the achomawi the pit river indians are divided into a number of tribes of which the principal are the following in fall river basin the achomawi on the south fork the humawi and hot springs valley the estaki wak in the same valley below, hot springs, the Hantewa and Round Valley. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, these in Hot Springs Valley, one of the tribes there. It says, let one remount at the hot springs and ride one easy day's journey down Big Valley where the mountains help to keep out the Devon Modoc slavers. And there is much improvement in the forms we meet. The faces are broad and black and black and calm and shining with an Ethiopian Unctuousness, whatever that means. But see what they're telling you? Ethiopian? Their face is Ethiopian? The foreheads are like a wall in those solid round cape cheekbones standing over against one another so far apart. And in those massive lower jaws, there is unmistakable strength bred in the bone through tranquil generations. But again, he's saying their faces are broad and black, but shining with an Ethiopian untouchedness is that what he means untouchedness <laughs> but ethiopian right you already know what he means by that we got another example further down in the book it says here the taipoxi chief of the chimteya was a notable indian and his generation holding undisputed sovereignty in the valley of the merced from the south fork to the plains Early every morning, as soon as the families had had time decently to prepare breakfast, he would step out before his wigwam and lift up his sonorous voice like a stentor, summoning the whole village to work in the gold diggings, and himself went forth to share the labor of the humblest. Men, women, and children went out together, taking their dinners along, and the village was totally deserted until about three o'clock. Everyone worked hard, inspired by the example of their great chieftain, the men making dives in the merced of a minute or more and bringing up rich gravel while the women and children washed it on shore. They got plenty of gold and lived in civilized luxury so long as Taipoxi was alive. He was described by one who knew him well as a magnificent specimen of a savage, all right, that's the hijack, standing fully six feet high, straight and sinewy, shiny, black as an Ethiopian, again, shiny black as an ethiopian shiny black chief chief indian california chief shiny black like an ethiopian he sounds like abraham lincoln how they're describing him shiny black as an ethiopian wake up break the spell stop with the pan-african opinions with eyes like an eagle's a lofty forehead nostrils high and strongly chiseled each of them showing a clean bold lips he died in 1857 and was buried in Rum Hollow with unparalleled pomp and splendor. Over 1,200 Indians were present at his funeral. You understand the, the power? You understand how much respect, how much honor this person, this chief had? We honor him and remember him. And here we are in regards to the Carella Indians. The Carella Indians and their dance is describing here. And I just want to show you here, it says, Then again, sitting in a solemn circle on the ground or slowly walking in a ring around the fire, 
hand joined in hand while the flames gleam upon their swarthy, so swarthy, can I get a so swarthy, swarthy faces, ripple in the folds of their barbaric paludaments of tasseled deerskin and light up their gross tech chaplets and club cues and nod in shadows. They intone those weird and eldritch chantings. All right, so he's trying to talk bad about their ceremonial dance, all right? But he's letting you know they got swarthy faces, all right? In another part of the book, another reference that says here, and yet when I saw the swarthy Uruk, the swarthy Uruk, we already got a reference of them being so-called black-skinned and various other shades, uh, right here calling them swarthy, so swarthy, creeping on all fours out of their round door holes or sticking their shock pates up through the hatchway of the assembly chamber, just on the level with the earth, I thought of black bears as often as anything. He's scared of them, just like a black bear. Swarthy Yurok. Right here, they're still talking about the Yurok tribe, the Yurok people. It says here, filthy as they are, they do not neglect the cold morning bath. All right, so he's calling them dirty until they have learned to wear complete civilized suits. It says here, take off the narrow breech cloths, which were their only coverings, and dip up the chilly brine over them with their double hands, letting it trickle all down their swarthy, swarthy bodies in a manner that made me shiver to see all right swarthy the sexes bathe apart and the women do not go into the sea without some garment on here they're talking about the henagi it says here the henagi deserve special mention on account of the handsome canoes which they fashion out of redwood i saw one on humboldt bay which had been launched by them on smith river and which had therefore demonstrated its seaworthiness by a voyage of over a hundred miles. It was 42 feet long and 8 feet 4 inches wide and capable of carrying 24 men or 5 tons of freight. It was a thing of beauty, sitting plumb and lightly on the sea, smoothly polished and so symmetrical that a pound's weight on either side would throw it slightly out of trim. 24 tall, swarthy, boatmen all right all right this is the henagi indians they're talking about again swarthy boatmen who have a ship that can travel 100 miles naked as said except around the loins standing erect in it as their habit is and with their narrow paddles measuring off the blue waters with long even sweeps must have been a fine spectacle it must have been a very fine spectacle wish we could have witnessed that ourselves right swarthy boatmen so swarthy we're gonna talk about the Gualala, the Gualala tribe. Guala, Guala, huh, interesting, huh? The Guala, Gualala. Says, while sitting near these Gualala and looking at the circle of swarthy faces, all right, so swarthy, so-called black faces, right? What does swarthy mean? Which the staggering blazes redly lighting up. I was not a little impressed with their resemblance to those calm, grand phases of old egypt not of modern egypt but old the real egypt but old egypt old egypt over there in the mississippi is that what you're talking about see what he's saying these gualala with swarthy faces resembling faces of old egypt probably the reader will smile here and i am well aware how greatly inferior these poor diggers are to the mighty race who built cheops huh that theme park over there we're talking about Tamari, the real one. That's why their faces resemble the old Egypt, because this is Egypt. You understand? Guala, Gualala. He says, I saw here the same scanty beards, the same full voluptuous lips, the same straight, strong noses with thick walls and dilated nostrils, the same broad cheekbones, the same large and prominent eyes, and most, the same expressions of restful and placid strength that I have seen among the Egyptian sculptures of the Berlin Museums. He's talking about the sculptures. He ain't even talking about the people he's seeing over there on the other side. He's saying these people look like the ones in the sculptures of the museums of these egyptian sculptures listen to what he's saying and the british museums of london where did they really get these relics from a lot of those came from ancient america they brought them to these museums and they told you they lied to you said they were coming from over there that desert over there in africa middle east asia over there but this author this is a very scholarly source he's telling you 
that they resemble these Egyptian sculptures that are in the Berlin Museums and the British Museum of London. The differences are that the Indians open their eyes more freely, except in extreme old age, when they are shriveled and nearly burnt out by the smoke and have lower foreheads and more shrunken cheeks, all right? Again, this was Contributions to the North American Ethnology, Volume 3, by the Department of the Interior, okay? U.S. Geographical and Geological Survey of the Rocky Mountains region. Tribes of California by Stephen Powers from 1877.